I think it was like um, five years ago, five years, yeah. I was still walking in Lagos. And I was coming back home from work. And the Lord spoke to me. And he said, when your nation will be delivered, it will be done by the youth. Yeah, and you know, that didn't make sense five years ago. When your nation will be delivered, the deliverance will be affected by the young people. I was, well, I wrote it down because I was not thinking about the deliverance of Nigeria at the time that the voice came to me. So I wrote it down. And I watched patiently for a time where there'll be mass movement, where the will of the youth will be registered in a commitment for the change of Nigeria. And right before my eyes, five years later, I saw a wind. A, a movement, a movement in the land that was not coordinated by any political factor, just a desire for emancipation. Then I remember the words of our God. I came to tell you that I am aware that this is the season that God spoke about our emancipation. I'm aware of it. Our deliverance will not tarry. That's why he said, you need to lift up the hands, the hand down. lift it up because the time of our liberty is here I saw those words begin to come to pass there was no reason why it should come to pass a sovereign hand of God went to work mass movement mass movement the chains of divination the chains of manipulation that held our nation it, it broke the ability to regulate everyone and keep them in line so that their bidding will find expression. That manipulation failed. So when we got the first sign at Ensas, ah, it was a great sign to me. As we mourned the dead among us that revolted, that cried out. I remember the story of redemption. The day Jesus died was not a peaceful day. It was a day of gloom, of sadness. But I came to tell you that the blood of those that were spilled at Lekki Toll Gate was not in vain. It was, it was for such a time as it is. Or maybe the votes in your polling unit did not count and that's why you are in despair. Oh my God, there's something bigger than that. Men have died for this day. Men die. Men have died. And the fact that there's discouragement everywhere will not stop us from going again to the polling unit. If we need to do it 10 times, our hands are strengthened. It will never hang down. Because this is the time for which the Lord speak that he will bring unto us salvation. Can you banish discouragement from Nigeria? Banish it from the land. Let hope spring forth like a well coming forth with fresh water. Let hope spring forth like the rising of the morning sun bringing illumination and discomfiting the covering of darkness. <laughs> we banish, we banish, we banish. Now, it is interesting for you to know that the choice of this scripture was prophetic. The scripture did not just come up. Are you, are you there? The Lord himself brought the scripture up. And that's why we are studying it today. Because we are gleaning light from the scripture with which to interpret the chaos that is captured as a nation. So we saw the rise of Adonijah. And what exactly was his ambition? What did he say? I will be king. Amen. He showed up on the scene with an ambition. And he seemed to be so sure of 
the structures he had put in place, his boasting was somewhat like the resolve of the functionaries at the Tower of Babel. He seemed to have considered all the variables surrounding his ambition and he couldn't see anything whatsoever possible that could stop him from being king. So he shows up, not because he's the most legitimate. I told you he was, he's the fourth son. There were four other guys before him, even though two had died. So at least there was still one before him. If, it, if we're looking at um, the issue of legitimacy, then it should fall to the eldest. So he was not the eldest. So he had his own basis of feeling, of thinking, and of saying that it was his turn. I will be king. So we looked at that. And we saw all the intrigues. We saw his fine political strategy. We saw his system of reconciliation to mend all the fault lines that were created by his ambition. And his plan indeed was flawless. He had already gotten the attention of generals in the army. He already had the sympathy of Abiata that was in the courts of the priesthood, the very with some valuables. But at the end of the day, somehow Abiata found himself in his camp. It, it's a, an intriguing political situation that we see here. But the only thing that Adonijah did not do is that he did not play what we call the politics of the bedchamber. The politics of the bedchamber is the dimension of politics that only the body of Christ in partnership with the Holy Spirit does in the most secret pavilion of kingdom influence. God is calling us as a church in the nation Nigeria to head for the bedchamber. As far as the political floor is concerned, it has already been annexed. In fact, the beagle of victory has already been sounded. And you could see diplomatic feasts were already going on. And the merriment of victory from the political um, wilderness was already registered. And he was already reigning. By that beagle of victory that was blown over the land, Adonijah was reigning already. But you see, the Bible says, Who is he that speaketh a thing and it cometh to pass when the Lord has not sanctioned it? It means that your politics is not complete if you have not yet gotten a verdict from the inner chamber. According to the systems that have been set up in the land to declare who wins or loses elections, you heard the, pro the proclamation. And... Uh, so there is jubilation in some camps, there is depression in the other camps. But I'm here to tell you that the story is not yet complete. We still have a ground that we have not heard from, and that is the inner chamber. So yesterday we saw the parable of Adonijah. Now we want to go into the politics of the inner chamber. That's the title of tonight's delivery. The politics of what? The inner chamber. <laughs> uh, uh, fortunately for us, not too many will be admitted into the inner chamber. So the politicking of lies cannot survive in the inner chamber. We want to take our microscope and look deeply into the inner chamber in order for us to understand it's politics. Isaiah chapter 59, verse 14, 15, and 16. God has many ways of occasioning deliverance. In fact, that's his specialty. He prides himself as a deliverer. And in the book of Isaiah chapter 59, verse 14, the Bible says, and judgment is turned away backward. That's what happened. No judgment. No scale of equity. No scale of justice. 
And when there is no scale of equity, no scale of justice, there is no reference point with which we can measure accurately. That kind of environment is an environment where anarchy, where disaster finds expression because justice is turned away backward. Is a justice, judgment is turned away backward and justice standard afar off for the truth is falling in the streets. The truth is falling. Where people have PVCs to vote and because a set of people perceive that those guys are going to vote for their opponents, they ensure that there's no voting. They say truth is falling in the streets and equity cannot enter. Next verse. He said, yeah, truth faileth. And he that departed from evil maketh himself a prey. And the Lord saw it and it displeased him that there was no judgment. 16. And he saw that there was no man. And he wondered that there was no intercessor. Therefore, his arm brought him salvation. So normally, normally God deploys his outstretched arm when there is no justice in the land. When truth has failed. When equity can no longer be part of our dwelling. Where injustice is now our justice. Where falsehood becomes our truth. In such a situation, it means that the systems of Babylon are beginning to be established in the territory. So God will need to do something drastic. Something he doesn't do every day. He will need to do it in that situation. And that's where he deploys the resources of his outstretched arm. I've been studying and praying and trying to find out what is suiting for the Nigerian situation. This was the scripture I found. His arm brought him salvation. <laughs> his what? His arm brought him And his righteousness, he sustained him. So there was a prayer that the prophets were taught to pray. They say, awake, awake, O arm of God. I need to teach you that prayer. It is a prayer designed to provoke God to stretch his arm. Oh, you have never seen God fight. You will see it, you will see it not too long from now. You you will be privileged. It will go on record. That's something you should tell your daughter that in the days of the arm of God. <laughs> Let me give you a scripture there. Um, awake, awake. Isaiah 51. Um, okay, let's do verse 9. This is the prayer prayed to release God's arm. This is the, this is the prayer for Nigeria now. Because when you notice that judgment, justice, equity is no longer part of our civilization, then we need to call the ruling hand of God from heaven to destabilize the system and to establish righteousness. He said, awake, awake, put on thy strength, O arm of the Lord. Awake as in the ancient days. In the generations of old, art thou not it that had caught Rahab? This is, these are the records of what the arm of God did. He caught off Rahab. What did he do again? He wounded the dragon. Now, when you look at this, our own case, it doesn't look like Rahab. Uh, our case looks like a dragon. <laughs> because when you are deploying the, the hand, and you need to tell the hand what to do. This is not a situation of Rahab. Huh? This is a beast. 
a beast trying to blot out every form of light so that we will become customary to darkness. Can you release the arm of God? Not just to wound, in this case, the, the arm wounded. No, we need something. Are you feeling what I'm talking about? <laughs> we, we need more, something more terrible than a wound. Mm. Awake. Can somebody say awake, awake? There was a reference point to the way he should awake. He said, awake in the same similitude as in the ancient days. As in the generations of old. We have an estimation of what an awoken arm can perform. There are records, chronicles, in the ancient days, in the days of old. That's how we want you to arise. Not in any magnitude diminished from what we know that the hand can perform. Is it not you that cut off Rahab? Are you not the same one that wounded the dragon? Verse 10. Are thou not it which are dried up the sea? And so the, 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 hand, the hand can dry up the sea. The waters of the great deep that thou had made the depths of the sea a way for thy ransom to pass over. The beast must be arrested so that the ransom again can pass on dry ground. We have been captured on an island where truth has been taken out. We have been dispossessed of justice because an order of impunity has been set up. You know, Nigeria is a funny nation. Part of the things that makes it funny is that there were people that won elections here that never ascended the throne. Think about it. Some people that won and the elections were not even being contested by anybody, any soul in the land. It was an exclusive machination of the bedchamber politics that blotted such names out of the hall of fame of the leaders in the land. A power beyond the stamp of our nation was responsible for obtaining the implication of those elections. All the money that was spent for polling, polling units, the materials that were printed, in fact, there were even buildings were built in the name of parties, and politics and all that took place. Nobody remembered all the money spent. The entire process was upturned by heaven. That's what we call an outstretched arm. It is beyond man. And that arm again, we await in 2023. And that's why I raised that scripture in the book of Isaiah, chapter 51. It says, awake, awake, put on thy strength. O arm of God. Are you there? Can you join me in the prayer? Because the arm of God is going to awake. I saved 25 minutes so that we can press. Uh, it, it might interest you that I had, I had encounters with Jesus in my closet. Yes, I have encounters, sweet encounters with Jesus in my closet. And the, the things I picked in my closet are not things I will discuss here. But I'm encouraged to continue this prayer mm, because I know it's the right thing to do. Hallelujah. He said, awake, awake. Put on thy strength, O arm of the Lord. This is the arm that dispossessed Pharaoh of his palaces of government. Rendered his rule futile. Even his days were cut off because he sought to resist this arm. He said, awake, fuel yourself. Put on your strength, O arm of the Lord. Awake, as in ancient days, in the generations of old, are thou not it that has caught Rahab and wounded the dragon? Finally, verse 11. Anytime the arm of God goes to work, this is what it produced. He said, therefore, the redeemed of the Lord shall return. 
and come with singing unto Zion. An everlasting joy shall be upon their heads and they shall obtain gladness and joy and sorrow and mourning shall flee away. Hmm. This is the only way we can end it. We shall return with singing unto Zion. The reason why we will come to Zion and not to Einek is because in Einek we do not find truth. In Einek there was no justice. We had to appeal to Zion. To make invalid, to invalidate the authority of Einek so that he will bring a position that is contrary to hmm? so that the redeemed of the Lord can what? Can return with singing unto Zion for an everlasting joy shall be upon their heads and they shall obtain gladness and joy sorrow and mourning shall flee away. Our prayers will continue until swearing in ceremony. Yeah, we will keep yeah. This is the time of deliverance. If our systems can no longer deliver justice, then we appeal to heaven. We request for an outstretched arm. Bring us liberty. Bring us salvation. In Jesus' mighty name.